All right, finally, a quick note on how this applies to some different questions. Looking at data, looking at trust, sustainability, and artificial intelligence. So the practicality of looking at data. From our discussions of compounding rates, you might be a bit wary now about how to look at average growth rates. If you know the growth rate over, say, four quarters of the year, can you just average those to find the growth rate over the year? Or if you know the growth rate of a certain investment over three years, is the average growth rate an accurate indication? Or maybe near an election, you might want to calculate economic growth over a politician's four-year term. Can you just, you know, average the years? Generally, the answer is not quite. It's because of compounding. Consider a really simple example. Investment grows by 5% in year one, then 5% in year two. So it averages 5%. Versus another investment that grows by 0% in year one, then 10% in year two. So that is the same average. Are those two investments gonna be equal at the end of two years? Do they have the same value? Not quite. $100 in the second investment grows 0%, so it stays at $100 after one year grows 10%, so that gets to 110. Whereas 100 growing at 5% after one year is 105. After another year of 5% growth, it's 105 plus five, so that's 110, but also a little sliver more from compounding, 5% of 5%, which is 25 cents. Not a lot, but not quite equal. But often, I mean, often a decent approximation for a lot of cases. For small growth rates over short time periods, they will be close. But for longer time periods or larger growth rates, they're not so close. I mean, again, extreme, think of investment over two years that grows by 0% then 100%. So it goes from 100 to 200 after two years. Versus an investment with the same average growing 50% then 50%. They both have an average 50% growth rate, but the second one, after year one, 100 grows to 150. After two years, that compounds, that's worth 225. 225 versus just 200, that's a bigger difference. Part of the skill of being an economics major comes from having experience with these sort of problems. Questions, so, you know, you build your number sense. You can be able to tell when an answer will give you an approximate good enough answer and when you have to do some more calculations. Another question, a little bit different now, how does trust relate to selfishness? A capitalist economy such as ours is said to run on selfishness. Everybody out for themselves. So how do they ever trust other people? I mean, how do we reconcile this selfishness in an economy that depends on tremendous amounts of trust every day in nearly every transaction. Discount rates. People demonstrate trust as an investment in a long-term relationship. For example, if you start your own business, maybe you're a consultant, your early clients might say something like, well, I got a lot of value out of that. I, I, I would have paid twice as much. I'd still be satisfied. That person's awesome. You, the consultant, are leaving money on the table in order to build a network of delighted customers who will refer others to you and return to you for more. Is that a good investment? That depends on your discount rate. You're giving up money now in return for money later. Discount rates are what allow rational people to compare two different units. A person with a high discount rate would put a high discount on future money. They wouldn't invest as much. A person with a low discount rate would invest more. People with low discount rates are going to be more trustworthy. For the same reason, corporations build brands that people trust, not because the corporation cares, but because they want future revenue. Long-term greedy versus short-term greedy is sometimes how it's phrased. Apple, for example, charges more, a lot more, for their products because they built a trusted reputation for quality. And they're one of the most valuable companies in the world because of that. That's why recruiters come to Colin Powell School, they look to hire people with integrity who are trustworthy. 
They want people who can help build a brand for quality over the long term. Another case where we use discount rates is in sustainability questions. As we consider costs far in the future, we have to figure out their present value today. Rational decisions compare costs and benefits, but they have to be in the same units. A dollar in the future is not the same unit as a dollar now. So suppose 100 years in the future, some catastrophe is going to cost us a billion dollars. Is that a really big number? How much is it worth paying now to avoid that cost? What should we society be willing to pay? That's the same calculation we did before. The present value is the value in the future divided by 1 plus the interest rate to the t power. But you got to note, if t is really big, and it's just a simple feature of math that any number greater than 1 raised to a really large power gets very big. That's like the rule of 70 that we talked about. A number can double quite fast and double again and again over a long enough time period. But dividing by that really large number makes the result really small. For example, a billion dollars, 100 years in the future, could be worth just $1 million today. Or it could be worth $135 million today, depending on what interest rate I use to discount. At a low discount rate, it's worth spending a good deal of money today to avoid that cost in the future. At a high discount rate, it's not worth spending that much. But, you know, the MTA makes these decisions as they consider modifications to, like, train stations, knowing that sea levels arise, storms get more intense, so they need better pumps, other adaptations. I mean, there are other philosophical issues. Is it moral to discount people in the future, below ourselves? We often do. And finally, on a sort of related note, question about AI risk, about effective altruism and effective accelerationism. They all have that same issue. What is a reasonable interest rate to use when discounting future costs and benefits? With the additional question of how do I adjust for risk? Usually a risky outcome has a higher discount rate. That gives the common risk-reward risk trade-off. A risky investment with a substantial possibility you lose your money must offer a high return to compensate for that risk. But a safe investment, where there's little possibility you lose your money, can offer a lower return because of that safety. Again, there are a lot of disagreements about what is the right amount to discount the future. But it is an important question.